Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know the first presentation of the day is a bit of a challenge to get here on time, so thank you very much. Um, my name is Natasha Bruce-Jones, and I'm the clinical director at Think Therapy First. We are a company of occupational therapists, and we are nationwide. I'm going to start by asking you all to use your phones, if you've got them in your hands, please, and go to the website www.menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com, and the beginning of this presentation is going to be interactive. So once you're on that website, I'm going to ask you two questions, and then your answers will appear on the screen. So we're not going to be tracking you, there's no confidential data being up here, it's all completely anonymous, um, so you should be fine and happy to answer nice and freely. Once you're on that web page, if you type in the number 61875311, you'll then be able to see the question, but I'll give you a bit of background before you answer it. And also then you'll continue to see the presentation on your phone. If you're near the back and can't read the screen, you'll have it on your phone the whole way through. So the first question is going to involve you thinking back to when you decided that occupational therapy was the career for you. That moment when you decided to commit the next two, three, four, maybe even more years of your life to study occupational therapy. That's quite a big commitment. And knowing that you're potentially going to spend the rest of your working career as an OT, there must have been something that really got you about it, something that had a, an internal drive for you, something that inspired you. So I want you to think about that feeling and then try and pick two golden words that sum up what made you choose OT. And I want you to put those into your answers. And when you press submit, they'll start appearing on the screen. Just so we can see, what was your why? Why did you become an occupational therapist? They'll appear instantaneously, but I'm happy to share my words with you. But it'll be interesting to see if my words appear on the screen as well. They actually did yesterday. So, okay, well, we're straight away. So someone's got one of my words. I was creativity. I'm still very strong on creativity and activity, definitely. There's a nice diversity of words in there. Independence, great, as we'd expect. Holistic, definitely, and that's something that I found quite challenging to balance in various jobs I've been in. That's always been a bit of a dilemma. Purpose, fantastic. If you've not got purpose in it, how are you going to get anyone to engage? The, these words always, when we finish the screen and you've got all your words up there, it's always a nice summary of this is what the key focus of OT should be. So it's interesting to reflect on whether this is how it is in reality. I'll just give you a few more minutes for anybody that hasn't put their words up there before we move on to the next slide. It looks like you're all there. So the next slide carries on from your thinking, where you were when you signed up, as to where you are now. So the next question is, it's just a yes or no response. Do you think that in your current role, you've actually got more to give than your role allows you to? Some very quick responses out there. Now, the reason I'm asking this is because I know at various points in my career, I've had to stand and really ask myself the honest question. Is what I'm doing actually occupational therapy? And I've questioned myself. And even if the answer is yes, is it good enough occupational therapy? Is it something I'm proud of doing? And is it good enough for my clients? Could I do better for them? And I know Amy and Emma, who are speaking later, have asked themselves the same question. And at various points, we've all come up with the answer, it's, it's not good enough. What we're doing wasn't enough for ourselves, and we felt we could give more to our clients. And it's at that point I, I moved towards independent practice. And that, personally for me, has given me so much more freedom and creativity in how I can deliver my occupational therapy. For those of you that have said yes, answer's still coming in, that's fine. Um, as a profession, we've always got history of verging on oppression. We're so flexible and adaptable. By the nature of being an occupational therapist, that's what we do best. That when you have service pressures and business demands, we often mould into what we feel we should be to meet the business and service needs. But that doesn't always mean we're meeting the needs of the client. And that didn't sit comfortably with me in so many jobs because I wanted to lead for the client rather than fit myself into the business. And that's when I became a bit of a disruptor. Um, as I'm sure some of you, when you speak out, people make judgments about you. But when you speak out for the voice of OT and the voice of your clients, you should be proud. We asked our associates. Now, associates for us are occupational therapists that stay generally in their mainstream job but work for us on their days off, working part-time, evenings, weekends, to supplement their work, doing private work for us. We asked them how they felt about the work they do for us and the occupational therapy they provide under our model. 
And these are the words they came up with. Now, we didn't prompt them. And as a business manager, when I read these, I just feel that we've got it right. To get these words of people's own, um, own thought pattern, it's, it just says that I'm happy with our business. But as a practicing frontline occupational therapist, which I still am, the words client-focused and life-changing just make me tingle with joy because that is what I was missing in my day-to-day -day job prior to coming into independent practice. So that's telling me we've got something right with our model. And that's because we allow OTs to be the OT they want to. We let them be creative, use activity, and be spontaneous with what they're doing and in their thinking. When I graduated, albeit a long time ago, I was told that the only way I'd get recognition in my career and develop as a quality OT was to find a specialism, to choose a sector, choose a skill set, choose a client group, and each time refine my skills until I was a specialist. And again, a bit pattern with me, that didn't sit comfortably with me because I felt as much as I had quality skills that were really high level, I was almost starting to cherry pick the clients I could see because some of them weren't complex enough for me, some of them weren't challenging enough. And I knew that my OT skills would benefit a whole spectrum of people rather than these few individuals that were being handpicked. So again, not comfortable with it, I changed it. When we started Think Therapy First, we flipped that model on its head. Those of you familiar with the Four Pillars document will recognize our model actually promotes the advanced generalist, the expert generalist. They are specialists in our eyes. We recognize people who have got skill sets across a, bo a broad spectrum. We recognize breadth of practice as our speciality. And that doesn't mean you need to be specialist in each of those areas. It means, means you need to be able to use your core OT skills. You need to be able to do quality activity analysis and use function, put purpose in your activities. That's what we recognize as a quality OT. The way we deliver our therapy, um, Amy and Emma are going to share some exact examples with you because case examples always bring things to life. But we work with people for up to one year. Anything beyond that, we believe, is fostering a level of dependency, which is the opposite of what we want. And we use projects as our method of delivery. So a project is a theme that runs throughout your rehab, a continuous motivation, a big goal at the end, something quite landmark that you want to achieve. We've got some pictures of people either on the way to completing their projects, smaller projects in between, or on completion of their final project. But one of the unique things we do is we recognize that statutory services, mainstream services, don't have the resources to focus on leisure. They're focused on essential life skills, basic survival skills, which is fantastic because those areas need to be covered. And we work alongside statutory services in respect of that. But we also recognize that leisure, if you're looking at a life balance, and you don't include leisure, that person's never going to be holistically treated. So we focus on the leisure, and we get a lot of engagement from that. And we can reflect that in our DNA scores, which are almost non-existent. Unless someone's acutely unwell and too ill to participate, people volunteer to come to our rehab. They enjoy their rehab. They have fun at their rehab. And that's reflected in our statistics. And also our outcome measures, which we'll share at the end. We have huge life-changing transformations and levels of achievement. And we do that because we focus on what the client's goals are. So we do a nice working um, self-care and life balance with the client at the center. So I'm going to hand over to Emma now, who's going to give you some exact examples of how we deliver. Hi everyone, thanks Natasha. So I'm going to take you through a case study um, of a client that I've worked with at Think Therapy First. So I'm going to introduce you to Margaret. Now when we first meet a client at Think Therapy First, we really take the time to get to know them, who they are as a person, and what are their key identifying roles. We can then work with them to identify their goals, establish an overarching project, and we can look at doing activities that are fun and meaningful for the client, so then straight away you've got the engagement and the motivation. So assessment processes often direct you to lead with condition and deficit. But by tapping into who the client is, you're really getting to know them, what was important before their life changed significantly, to then start and guide the assessment process. So who was Margaret as a person? She was a wife, she was retired, but she spent all her time at her own stables, and her passion there was looking after and taking care of animals. Where she wasn't at the stables, she was out walking. She loved the hilly countryside walks with the dogs. 
She loved socialising with friends, going to Aquafit, going to the theatre. And when she was at home, it was really important that she kept it in pristine condition. Now, in 2020, life changed dramatically for Margaret. She was involved in a road traffic accident. She sustained a severe head injury, 11 fractured ribs and a fractured clavicle. And that had a huge impact on her function. She couldn't use her left upper limb. She had difficulty, quite a lot of cognitive difficulties, specifically with attention, concentration, information processing and memory. And also problems with balance and depth perception. So if we look at her occupations, she couldn't fulfill hardly any of them. She couldn't get washed and dressed anymore. She couldn't get up to the stable. She couldn't groom her ponies. She couldn't muck out the chickens, feed the cats. Her balance problems meant she couldn't go for walks. And her cognitive deficits were so severe, she couldn't even sit and watch television. She couldn't concentrate. She'd get very distracted. She couldn't read a book. So her life suddenly became very, very small. And she stopped participating in activities. So working holistically with the client, we also consider how their injuries affect them in their different environments. And sadly for Margaret, she couldn't function in any of her usual environments. Again, she became very isolated. She couldn't go into town anymore. She couldn't go to the theatre. She couldn't attend a stables, join friends. Her existence was confined to a chair at home. So we did our assessments to identify some key goals. But it can sometimes be overwhelming when working with clients with such complex and debilitating injuries, working out where and how to start with therapy, especially when we're focusing on all aspects of the life, self-care, productivity, and leisure, and not just looking at basic needs to make them safe. Um, but having got to know the client, the way that we assess, looking at their key identifying roles, looking at their occupations, and considering their environment, it actually makes it really fun and easy to identify what their key goals are. And this is just a snapshot of some of um, Margaret's goals. So she wanted to get back to full duties at the stables. She wanted to be able to do her laundry and house cleaning, hang her washing out on the line, that was really important, to ascend, attend social events with friends. And we established that a really good overarching project for her was to be to open a rescue centre for horses at her stables, because that incorporates her passion. And it would mean that to get to there, she's got to achieve all the other goals along the way. So again, what does therapy look like for someone with such complex deficits and such big goals? Well, we use activities. We use them functional activities, meaningful activities to work towards our goals. We started with a trip to the stables to feed the cats. Now this activity, it seems quite simple, but it was something she was very motivated to do. We had to plan the activity, which worked on cognition. We had to get her ready to be out of the house, so we did some sequencing cards for getting washed and dressed in the morning, and we agreed that I would pick her up ready to go at 9 a.m. sharp. This meant that she was motivated, she had to get up, and she got herself washed and dressed. And sure enough, she was stood at the door at 9 o'clock ready to go. So I let her take the lead. We drove up to the stables. I let her take the lead to show me around. I was kind of just in the background, silently ready and waiting to support her just in case. But she took the lead. She was opening gates, she was opening padlocks. She was showing me around. So she's working on upper limb strength, grip, dexterity, again, coordinating a movement and getting used to being on that slightly uneven terrain. So I got her to teach me her routine for feeding the cats. We graded the activity, we did it, and gradually increased her independence until the point she was going up to the stables every day to feed her cats. So then it was time to progress. So what did we do? We started to go on country walks, circular dog routes, dog walking routes. And again, we could use that for cognitive rehab. We used the sessions to plan the routes where we were going. And I would gently encourage her to look at the really busy dog walking routes. Because then while we're out and walking, she had to switch her attention between talking to me and other dog walkers and people that knew her. So we were working on attention while outside in the outdoors doing something that she loved. Quite a physical rehab. We were out walking in the hills, building up her aerobic function. And we were also able to work on fatigue management. We were looking at activities, breaking them down and giving her some structure to her day with meaningful activity and rest to gradually build her activity tolerance. So we soon progressed to being able to groom ponies. Now this was such a highlight for me as a therapist because um, it was one of her most favorite activities to do and one that she thought she would never be able to get back to doing. So again, her teaching me how to groom ponies, because I'd never done this before, um, it meant that she was truly at the centre of her own rehabilitation. She was regaining her sense of identity, 
and her confidence, while also improving her upper limb skills again. My job, I saw it, was to be in the background, to let her take the lead and use my skills as an OT to analyse the activity, look at the risks, assess dynamically, and just be there again, ready to step in as we needed, ready to look at the activities, break them up, step in, so the client was at the centre and the focus, of the focus. And also letting her feel like she was in charge. So what outcomes did we achieve from our approach to rehabilitation? Well, actually, there were so many, I can't get them all on there. So we've picked a few golden moments. Her project completion, she got to the point where she took in a rescue horse at the stables and nursed it back to full health. This was massive for her. She was back to being who she was. On the back of our therapy, on all the strategies and the skills that we'd worked on through activity, she, she developed the confidence and skills and abilities to take herself out to travel into the city centre on the bus to buy a dog's favourite shoes. So I went to see her one day, she said, you never guess what I did. She'd planned it all, she'd made a plan, she'd done the timing, she'd worked out her money for the bus fare, she'd got one sort of money in one pocket, the return bus fare in the other one, and a little envelope, and she'd put in how much she needed for the dog shoes and the names of the dog shoes. So she knew what she was doing, she'd planned the time, and she did that independently, using the skills and strategies that she'd learned through the activities we'd been doing in other therapy sessions. Another thing that she did autonomously and independently, she told me one day, I've invited everybody around, I've done afternoon tea in the garden. So this was somebody, because she would get lost in conversation previously, her confidence was gone, and being a, around people with multiple conversations going on was really, really overwhelming for her, but she did it. Again, she used a strategy, she'd built a confidence, she knew that she has to ask people to slow down, she might ask them, to, ask them to repeat themselves and to just talk one at a time. And she felt confident in doing that, her friends respected it, they knew what to do, and she had a really successful afternoon tea. So at the end of the therapy, she had achieved all her goals, and she also achieved optimum scores in all her standardised assessments, which you can see in the stars on the right-hand side, which were really quite impaired on every level when we did our first assessments. Um, so we, yeah, when we first see a client, we'll do initial assessment, we'll do all the standardised scores, and then every month we'll repeat those, so we've got outcome measures as we go along. And at the end of therapy, yeah, she's got full marks in all her scores. She became an expert in her own rehabilitation and, and it meant the skills that she had the skills to continue her therapy independently. And that meant that it was we were ready to close because she was time to con she was ready to continue her own <laughs> rehabilitation. So she regained her own sense of identity. She was able to fulfill her own key identifying roles in all environments. And she achieved optimum scores with all standardized assessments. So rehabilitation took nine months to get to that point. And that might seem quite short, but I think it is really our unique approach to rehab that can get those results so quickly. We put the client at the centre of everything we do. We're very activity focused. We're always working on multiple aspects of rehab during one session. But then we also have a very strong in-house team. Every associate that's working with a client, even when we're working with clients, will have somebody who is our mentor. So they're there to support you along the way. If ever you've got any questions, queries, hiccups, there'll be somebody that's been there, done it, got the answer. So you always can stay on track with your therapy. So that is a snapshot of one of our clients. I could talk forever because it's very exciting. I feel very passionate, but I'm going to hand over to Amy to talk you through another case. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Morning, everybody. Um, I would like to talk through uh, a tr polytrauma case, if that's all right. So I'd like to introduce, it to you, introduce you to my client, Harry. Um, and on the screen are some of the meaningful occupations uh, that he engaged in regularly and were part of his key identifying role, uh, roles before the accident occurred. So... Prior to the accident, Harry was living a really, you know, very active and independent lifestyle. He's 21 years old, at home with mum and dad, but he was um, studying to be a, a bricklayer. So that included him attending college one day a week, and then the other four days a week he'd be on the job learning as he, um, as he goes. He enjoyed playing airsoft with his friends. And he lived for bikes. So bikes were a passion of his dad and his brothers. So every weekend he would um, attend bike meets and he'd all, he's always, he was always tinkering with bikes. So um, in early 2020, 
Harry was riding his motorcycle and he was hit um, by a car and he sustained multiple injuries. Um, he sustained pelvic fractures and a fractured femur and both of them required a metal work insertion. Um, his dominant wrist was fractured. He had uh, lumbar spinal fractures, um, a tear in his bladder, internal bleeding and multiple soft tissue injuries. So he was um, yeah, quite, quite catastrophic injuries. So he was referred to Think Therapy first for an assessment of his immediate rehab needs um, of just a few weeks after his discharge from hospital. So at the time of my assessment, Harry was um, unable to wait there. He was um, relying on a wheelchair, stuck living in one room on the ground floor with a hospital bed, commode, um, and he, couldn't, he needed help with all personal care and he couldn't access the kitchen, so he couldn't get himself a, a drink or a, a snack. So very dependent on his parents. So through the process of completing my assessment, I was able to begin considering um, Harry's occupational performance and how that was being shaped by person, environment um, and occupation. So we're all familiar with the PEO model, I hope. Um, so as you can see there, there's huge deficits in all three areas. Um, and that's led to, you know, reduced participation and occupational performance, which is highlighted in the grey area in the middle. Uh, and I'll come back to that at the end. So following my assessment, Harry was able to identify uh, numerous goals that he wanted to achieve in his rehab programme. So I've just picked out a few of his kind of key goals. So uh, immediately he wanted to be able to get washed and dressed independently. He didn't want to use a urine bottle anymore. He wanted to have a stand-up wee. That was very important to him. Um, he wanted to get back to his apprenticeship. He wanted to attend the Isle of Man TT races with his friends in the summer that had been planned. Um, get back on his motorbike and do something meaningful and, and like a leisure pursuit because he was living a very small, insular life at the time. So how we delivered therapy. In the very early days, we began with um, lots of standing practice and we practiced transfers. Um, and then once he was up on crutches, we began uh, working on his exercise tolerance and his, his mobility. So we took therapy outside and we started off with really short walks just to the post office and back and then gradually built them up. Um, so there are a few of our more challenging walks. So our coastal walks and our woodland walks. Um, and then we started working on upper limb rehab tasks by getting him into his shed uh, and working on restoring a remote control car that he had. So he fixed and spray painted his airsoft gun as well, which he then went on to sell on eBay. And this helped us identify a project that he could use throughout the course of his therapy intervention. So we were looking at something that motivated him and was meaningful to him and worked on um, all of his goals. So the project he picked was to restore a motorbike, uh, which went on for a few months, and he was able to do that outside of therapy and keep him um, engaged. So he had to remove and clean the brakes, he had to replace the headlamp, fit the ignition, the carburetor, and then he painted and polished the bike and was able to sell it on eBay for uh, quite a, a decent profit in the end, actually. Um, so this project worked on Harry's stand and tolerance, his stand and balance, his ability to kneel, uh, his grip, grip strength, his wrist range of motion, dexterity. And it was, you know, whilst keeping him involved in an activity that motivated him and kept him engaged, which also required careful planning and preparation. We then um, needed to take it further. So we used an interest checklist just to help identify what his, you know, what his interests are and where we could take therapy forward. So he previously enjoyed carp fishing as a teenager with his stepdad. So we had to analyze the activity together and we identified some equipment that meant he could participate in this activity independently. So this included, um, I think we, all, we managed to get him a height adjustable chair, a fishing chair that also turned into a wheelbarrow so that he could get his fish and tackle from his car, um, from the car park down to the bank side independently. 
And then during fishing, we kind of worked on his upper limb rehab by getting him to mix his bait, throw his bait out into the lake, and then use a catapult, you know, pulling the elastic with his right hand, again, working on that, um, that right wrist. Um, and he set up all of his rigs, to, which worked on his fine finger movements and dexterity. So we then um, progressed to looking at return to work and how that might look for him. So he was now independently mobile and his pain levels were much more tolerable. So we could, you know, we could pace, bring the activity levels up a bit more. So we started thinking about return to work. But physically, he had deconditioned quite significantly, as you can imagine, previously working as a bricklayer four days a week and then doing very little after that. So his mum had a, a small holding, so we took our therapy there and we were just mimicking some of those essential work tasks um, just on the land. Um, and we'd previously assessed that using like a job demand and task analysis together. So he needed to be able to carry 25 kilograms to get back to work and college. So we started light and got him a gym membership and built it up. And we just concentrated on loading exercises. And I left him with an exercise program to do on his days when I didn't see him. So in order to get him back to work in some capacity, we managed to get funding for him to do a teleporter course. So there he is at the bottom. That's him in his um, teleporter on site. So that meant that he could get back to work in a lighter role um, quicker than you know, waiting until he could lift 25 kilograms comfortably, um, which gave him a, a purpose. So the entire rehab journey took 11 months. Um, and at the end of that um, time, he was back doing his uh, job. He was at college full time and he's due to qualify in March next year. So I'm so excited to hear about that. So at the end of therapy, Harry achieved all of his goals. And here are some of the key outcomes and golden moments. I won't talk through all of them, but he obtained his CSCS qualification. He went on a camping trip to the lakes with his friends. He caught a 16 pound carp and he restored the motorbike and sold it on, which was just amazing. So fishing became a really meaningful occupation for Harry from which he got a huge sense of achievement. So much so that he went on to develop an Instagram account and he would showcase all of his catches, which was just great. Um, so one particular golden moment is right there. Um, that iconic kneeling down, holding the cap photo, um, which he never really, he never thought he'd be able to achieve because um, the, the knee damage meant that, the, you know, kneeling down was particularly uh, difficult for him. So one of the reasons... Um, yeah, sorry. So he, he was so proud of this moment that he's allowed me to share that with you all today. So when I first assessed Harry, I brought your attention to the fact that there were problems in all three areas, meaning that his occupational performance and participation uh, were minimal, and that was reflected in the grey area on the image to the left. After his rehab, you can see that there was a better occupational balance with increased participation and occupational performance. And because we're looking at the whole person within their environment and their key occupations, the client is their expert in their own rehab journey. So my job as the occupational therapist is to use my key skills uh, that I developed in training to analyze and grade activity so they're achievable with progression. I'm not a specialist in trauma and orthopedics, but I am a specialist in using my core OT skills that we all learned in our training. Um, so I would now like to hand you back over to Natasha to wrap up our presentation. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed hearing about our cases. Um, we do have a huge number of cases um, with great results. But again, here are just a few of the really life-changing examples. Um, you can hear more about them at our stand, which is K49. But we have a number of cases where the medics give information where they're not considering function, they're just considering diagnosis. And our clients come to us almost having written themselves off because they've been told devastating news. The top example there, um, she was an older teenage girl told she'll never walk again, her TBI. Um, she came to us saying, there's no point walking on, uh, working on walking because I'll never walk again. By the time we'd finished therapy, which was a year later, working hand in hand with physio, not only had we got her walking, we got her walking for three miles round an air ambulance field where she was raising money for the air ambulance that saved her life. And that was her project. 
Now, if that doesn't make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, then I don't know what does. But we've got numerous examples where people in the medical model have followed their guidance, and as a functional model, we've brought hope back to people. Now, it's not saying we can reverse medical diagnosis, but it's about being realistic about expectations and not writing people off just on a basis of diagnosis. We are function-led, not diagnosis-led. And that's when, being an OT, you can really change people's expectations. When you unleash the potential of an OT, you can unleash someone's life potential. We work in the personal industry sector primarily. We are open to anybody that wants to refer to us, but our biggest um, industry basis at the moment is personal injuries, so we work a lot with insurers and solicitors and case managers. And our biggest impact at the moment is changing their understanding of what occupational therapy is. When we first came into the industry, the understanding from insurers and solicitors was OTs will either come in and do a one-stop assessment and then disappear, or they'll provide equipment and then disappear, or they'll write lengthy reports that often aren't read, as we all know. Um, we changed that, and our insurers and our solicitors now understand what occupational therapy is and the scope and the breadth of what we can do. So they refer to us knowing that they've got the confidence that we will address the holistic nature of the client. We've also started changing their understanding of when to refer to us because we were getting clients that maybe had been in the case management system for a while and had stagnated, weren't moving forward with complex cases. So we were getting referred them maybe two, three years after the injury. Now our referrers understand the earlier you get therapy, the bigger changes we can get. So it's instrumental getting referral at the right time. So we are getting our referrals earlier. So we've made them understand that when you think about therapy first, you get better outcomes. And that's ultimately why we are Think Therapy First. I'm going to conclude on that because we have overrun slightly. Um, if we've got time for questions, great. I don't know. No, we've no time for questions. But we are at stand K49, so please do come and see us if you've got any questions, if you want to know more about us, if even if you want to join us as an associate, do come along and speak to us. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much.